Ebony the Cat, Price. After Ebony thinks that it's a long shot but someone's counting on her, we see Simpson the Cat reassure Captain Plunder that his bad luck will go away. Oh, this better be good. Plunder wastes a ton of time reminding us about his curse and says all he's got left is a broken wreck, Simpson, and Bilch. Then we see Bilch trapped in a bottle because a mere specter is no deterrent to Ebony, apparently. She says she wants help from Simpson, and she says his true form. So Simpson transforms into a blue form, saying that Simpson was just one of his many forms. Supposedly, he's Lord Baktu, the one who brought the gift of magic to Mobius, so he can't be that bad of a person then, if he was generous enough to do that. You'd think a villain would just keep his magic to himself so he could terrorize everyone else. So why is he portrayed as smirking? Nothing about this makes sense. He's called a Tantaror, and says that few have the skills to see through his illusions. Since when can Ebony see through illusions? I guess they just do whatever they want with their character. It's new powers as the plot demands. I'm really confused and stuck on the fact that she magically knew Simpson was just a disguise for no reason. You'd have to be crazy to think that was the case. Bacto says that following Plunder around was entertaining because his obliviousness to who he really was amused him. Yeah, this isn't the proper continuation of Sonic the comic. Well, this is an interesting twist. It clearly came out of nowhere, and isn't true to the spirit of the comic as a result. Simpson being this thing. Really? That's like a fanfiction. Ebony says that there's a Tantaror artifact that she needs from him so that she can save the life of a friend. He says that he thinks he's more than just her friend. I thought she was in a mother figure role to Supersonic because she was letting him stay with him and taught him to work at her bar. And most importantly, she's so much taller than him. So she always came off as an adult compared to Supersonic. So clearly he would be like a son to her if he was more than just a friend to her. Didn't she ruffle his hair at one point? If they were supposed to be shipped together, they would have been drawn as the same height. They would have kissed in the Sonic the comic. Once again, not a true continuation at all. Ebony says she'll do him a favor, and for some reason he's happy with her only helping him once instead of helping him forever. Plunder says that if he's going to be granting wishes, he wants his bad luck curse removed. Oh, so a wizard did it. And worst of all, that wizard was his goofy friend the whole time. That's not believable. Sure, Simpson was always magical, he could summon a light bulb and everything. But this guy has a completely different personality from Simpson. They're clearly not the same character. It feels more like you replaced Simpson and nobody knew about it. So if this was supposed to explain Plunder getting over his bad luck curse, then it really should have been said that his curse was just temporary. Because this isn't what Sonic the comic would have done. He could have found a genie and wished it away and that would have been less forced. I actually like STC Online's explanation a lot better. At least it tried to be charming and funny. Here, he gives Simpson the bottled filch, and Simpson finds it entertaining that he's betraying him. So he gives Plunder and Ebony what they want. Whatever. So this is supposed to explain why Plunder is almost completely devoid of Fleetway characters with him aside from Zorabelle later? This isn't canon to me. It's pretty disrespectful to Simpson as a character to just completely retcon him and go, Oh, he was never actually this guy. He was lying all along, even though there's no indication of that. He was actually this other guy who was nothing like him. Just to suit your needs. Ebony goes up to a staircase and sees a giant green thing and says that she'll do anything to save Super, even unlock the eternal mysteries of some strange creature. Simpson says that she's done well in finding where the Dracons hid his long-lost heck eye. But she doesn't need to see all the secrets. Why would they hide it instead of bring it with them to Planet Drac? She says that she was close to what she needed and could feel it. And he asks her what she has to offer. All I have to say about the story is, why the hell does Back 2 have to be Simpson all along? That is so stupid and disrespectful to Fleetway canon. There's a reason SCC Online doesn't do this to the Fleetway characters. It's off-putting, comes out of complete nowhere. It's a deus ex machina. Plunder doesn't earn getting his curse removed. He took multiple issues to get it removed, he, and he went on a journey in SCC Online. This is as impactful and satisfying as not reading the story at all. But sadly, I have to know about the story, because, like, people will tell me, no, 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 this is how Plunder got his curse removed. 
It would actually be better if they didn't explain it at this point. Sonic the Continuation, Issue 1 We start with narration from someone saying that there's been moments where his thoughts led him to dark places, as we see a flashback of when Sonic was holding Master Emerald about to fall. It's annoying me that I don't know who's speaking in the narration right away. We see a flashback to when Robotnik left the sewer pipe after being ousted as ruler of the world. And I notice that he's not drawn to be covered in sewer gunk like he was back then. So that's yet another continuity error for the comic that specializes in that. But this is an error that's actually an improvement. Because while it was more realistic that the sewer pipe would have stuff in it that would get all over Robotnik and Grimer, I was also confused that they survived having such toxic stuff on them. So it should have been explained that they gave themselves a cure they made for that situation. Meanwhile, in this universe, we can assume that there was nothing in the sewer pipe for some reason. So Robotnik got nothing on him from it. It wouldn't make any sense that he would come back here after getting the gunk off him. What would he have to gain? The narration is Robotnik being mad about the fact that since he was deposed, he's reduced to a husk of his former self thanks to Sonic. It's unique to see him with a beard as well as a mustache. Now he looks manlier than ever, and a kind of a new level of intimidating. But is him looking different gonna signify something, or is it just gonna be pointless in the long run? At least when Sniffly had a beard in the reboot, it made sense because he was in a different position than we were used to, working for Gun. This is the same old Robotnik as usual. He looks like someone who'd be expected to live in the woods, hunting and gathering like a wild man. But he's still in a technological place and wearing the same outfit. The beard probably just signifies that he stopped giving a shit about something as pointless as shaving because he's mad that he got deposed. But if that's a justification, it makes it all the more confusing that he didn't end up with a beard in SEC Online. Or before it. This page was a waste of time. We already know all of this. Someone says he won't help him in disappointment, and we see Dr. Thackeray make fun of Eggman for being a hermit living in a cave. It doesn't seem like a cave. Eggman naturally points out that there's no point in continuing because whatever he does, Sonic will stop him. If Eggman was really a genius, he'd have reached this point a lot earlier, and it'd be permanent. He's really better off going to another universe where Sonic can't stop him. But with his luck, Sonic would get a genius friend of his to build a portal generator and follow him there anyways. Or he'd have to deal with heroes native to that universe, but he's not mentioning that. Zachary taunts Eggman and wants to leave, giving up on him. And Robotnik wonders if he's right that Sonic made him give up, instead of knowing that already, somehow. Robotnik thinks that the idea of allowing Sonic to dictate how he ordered his life was so contrary to his very state of being, that it was the ladder he needed to climb out of the pit of madness he fell into. So basically, he reasoned himself back into sanity. Ian Flynn style. To be fair, this is much more easy to understand and swallow. He's not acting as crazy as he did in Archie. It makes sense that Eggman would be motivated to not give up because giving up is what Sonic would want. But if it was that easy, why didn't he come to this conclusion himself a long time ago? Why'd he get to this point at all? Surely it was obvious of a conclusion to come to. Wouldn't Grimer have told him this? Whatever. He wasn't literally totally insane in Fleetway like he was in Archie. In Archie, he wasn't able to understand what period in time he was in and had a different personality. So here it's more believable because Eggman merely got driven into despair and needed a pep talk. He still wanted to destroy the world. So he decides to threaten the people of the planet with his egg carrier. So how do you get the materials for that? I guess he used the materials he magically had for making badniks. We cut to seeing Fleetway Sally reporting as a news reporter from Metropolis City's courthouse, and it's so weird that she looks like Archie Sally, and Reboot Sally of all things. This stands out as something that would only happen in a fan comic. It makes it look like Archie instead at first glance when it's supposed to be Fleetway. She's in a very different position in life than Sally from Archie. She's a news reporter, that's all. A very minor character. So that's why there's no logical reason to make her look just like Archie Sally. A much more important character in Freedom Fighter. I don't think a news reporter would be dressed like this. Elmer Fudd was the news reporter in the Looney Tunes show, and he was wearing a different outfit. Right from the first time I saw Fleetway Sally, I complained at length about how bad it was that she looked like that when she had the same name as our Sally. So making her look like Archie Sally is definitely a step in the right direction that I wish they did originally, 
It's just that it's so obvious that she needs a completely different outfit because she's not Archie Sally, she's Fleetway Sally. Why would she wear shorts like she's a soccer player who's athletic? Make her wear an outfit that Lois Lane would wear. That's not hard. Instead, she's drawn to look like a confusing canon immigrant from Archie Sonic. And the reboot of all things. How is that fan service? This would make some people hate seeing this and be confused into thinking it's putting an Archie character into the comic when it's actually not. There hasn't been much actual plot to the issue so far. I'm just distracted into long trains of thoughts by minor problems like this, when I'd rather be able to just get a move on. The point is, Fleetway Sally's reporting on the fact that Grimer's trial is about to start. Since we're actually seeing it, when trials are boring, I'm guessing something's gonna go wrong. Like you might escape, or somehow be found not guilty. Should we really see the evidence against them when we already know the history best to see by now? Tails tells Sonic that he's recording the trial so that Sonic can play it back whenever he gets depressed in the future. It's surprisingly big of Sonic to just casually admit to Tails that he might get melancholic sometimes and need to do this. But the fact that he's being written to look forward to things going well is another thing that makes me wonder if this is just telegraphing that the story's one big hope spot. I'm getting flashbacks to the story about Jeffrey's trial, where everyone should have known he would have been pardoned by Exus at the end and were excited for it anyways. Amy tells Sonic that he ought to be taking the trial more seriously. Why? This is writing her like a parody of Sally. Not the female Sonic. I don't see her logic. She should know that Grimer's trial is important to Sonic, too. And it being important to him is why he's acting like this. Sonic reminds his friends that they are just saying he should relax more. So we see the judge, who's a green duck-like being but with black hair. He says that what Grimer did is public record. So the trial will focus on determining which punishment is sufficient for such crimes. So is he not going to get a good enough punishment? He says there's going to be a Counselor Harvey for the prosecution. He reminds me of Harvey Who and Archie. Again, it's pretty gutsy to have Archie characters here. It's something only a fan comic would get to do, so it takes advantage of that more. And it's something that helps separate it from SSC Online, which was trying to be more professional. Complete with having separate stories for, for like, Sonic and Tails and Knuckles, like SCC. This feels like much more of a spin-off fan comic. Then a laser blast through the wall, shattering all of the glass windows in the courthouse. Well, something went wrong really quick. Good, it's not Robotnik who's saving him by himself. That would be too predictable. Instead, he's being rescued by Evil Rouge, Storm, and some OC characters who look sufficiently evil without looking like terrible reboot character designs. Aside from maybe the girl with the southern accent. She says she needs Grimer. Why? Why is Rouge working for them? Is she the Evil Rouge in this continuation too? I'm glad, because we need to see a unique interpretation of Rouge more than just once. And after all, it's easy to type down Rogue when you want to type Rouge. I'm just surprised that it did this instead of distinguishing itself from SSC Online more. One of the girls threatened someone with a gun. I don't know her name, because none of these villains have name tag text boxes. And Rouge feels the need to threaten Grimer with a knife to motivate him to come along with her for some reason. Even though it's either he goes with her, or he has to get punished in a trial. He doesn't have a choice. Rouge says she'll let the captain explain what she wants. I would have predicted the pirate ship showing up, because it was spoiled on the cover, but I refuse to pay much attention to the covers because I don't want the issue's plots to be spoiled for me. So I only clicked on the cover pages when I had to make the videos. Sonic runs out of the base, presumably to go stop the villain team, and one of his friends shouts out his name. As if they instantly have no faith in Sonic the Hedgehog, the super fast main character of the franchise, to be successful, and instantly assume that it'll go so wrong for him that he's better off not trying to do anything. I'm guessing Amy said this, since she's Sally now. So I'm guessing Sonic will horribly fail. After all, if he succeeded, then we won't get to see the intriguing story arc concept of some new team of villains having Grimer work for them for a while. So Sonic winning would be less interesting. Wasting a significant idea. And to be fair, Sonic is outnumbered. But I know for a fact that he can create a tornado just by running around, and even if he doesn't want to get instance caught up in it, he could still homie attack any criminal he needs to. I'm guessing that won't happen, and the story will frustrate me. And it would have been much better if Sonic was put out of commission while they were doing this with Grimer. Like if he was asleep with the flu, or hurt. 
Rouge was expecting Sonic to show up and is holding onto a ladder already. And Sonic's anticipating Captain Plunder, as he seems to, I guess, briefly run up a wall to clean himself off on the way to the floating pirate ship. So, it's not even like he got to the courthouse in time. I naturally assumed he would get there, instantly. Because he's usually portrayed as so fast that he can run across the whole planet multiple times in like 10 seconds. Wasn't he super fast in Fleetway too? But here, I guess they're going with the logic that he's only as fast as sound. And that's not enough to crisscross the whole planet instantly. So maybe it makes sense that Metropolis is just that far from Sonic that he didn't get to Grimer before he could be sent to the pirate ship and lifted away. I'm just so used to Sonic being the fastest thing alive that I operate under the logic that he can practically teleport from point A to point B. So seeing that he was too slow is pretty weird. He gets flung into and grabbed by a flying person with a horned helmet, who takes it as a compliment that he's not Captain Plunder. He gets dropped and lands on and grabs the wing of Tails' plane. And Tails refers to the bad guy group in general as pirates, and they actually teleport away from Sonic. And Tails assumes they're using a star post to do so without seeing one first. But Plunder had one on his own ship, so... Sonic was relatable in this page, naturally being impatient and snarking at Tails for stating the obvious. Thank you, Tails, I really could not have figured that out by myself. Although it's a weak, sarcastic quip by his standards. Get used to this, he doesn't feel like Fleetway Sonic in this comic. That was kind of much better written than I thought it was going to be. Rather than an infuriating scene in the courthouse where Sonic was wimpified in a fight and it stretched my disbelief having him lose, he simply didn't get there in time before Grammar could be taken to the ship and warped out of here. But considering how he's known for being as fast as possible, it still takes me out of it that the whole plot happens because he was too slow. It should have been clearly explained right away how far away Metropolis is from his home base and how fast Sonic runs, and how much time passed when Sonic was running. Because I never had the impression that Metropolis was far away from Emerald Hill Village, because those two are the main locations of Sonic the comic. We see them all the time because they're the two main places the heroes live. They won't feel like SCC otherwise. So I assume they'd be close together. Meanwhile, it's thankfully lampshaded that Grimer should show some gratitude for people who rescued him. She thinks he was rescued from a certain death sentence. That's not guaranteed, though. He could have been sentenced to community service under supervision. It could be seen as smart to make use of his intelligence for the greater good, even if he has to be forced into it. Because doing something with him like, say, forcing him to make the cure for cancer would be much better than killing him and be well worth the later consequences of keeping him alive. Grimer is shown a grey bracelet with a red circle, and is sold by someone that either he helps them discover how to use it, or will be killed. What a needlessly dark and edgy line. He could have just said he'll kill him, or torture him, more believably, because he can't actually kill him or be useless to them. It looks familiar. Meanwhile, Kinderport tells Sonic that sky pirate raids everywhere have been on the rise for the last few days. Amy says that they need to find out what's driving these raids and they only have the one Sky Pirate contact. So they have to track down Captain Plunder, who has never been associated with these specific people before. But it can't make sense if there were other pirates. Kentibor says that according to the new surveillance network, his ship, the Rabbit's Foot, was sighted off the coast of Westside Island. I like that the writer bothered to give his ship a name, even if it should obviously have every word of it capitalized, not just the first one. And at least it's new that Westside is spelled with two words instead of one. I wonder if this is contradicting Sonic the comic. Or maybe it's a completely different island from Westside Island. It seems on original and lazy that's Westside Island instead of clearly a brand new location the writer would have to think up and add to the world. Anyways, Amy says she'll monitor the pirate raids until he and Tails get back to try to find a pattern. Sonic then stands on the wing of the plane as it starts flying, and the flying camera from Sad M spots him, another reference that would never happen in SEC or even SEC Online. Sonic hopes Plunder will have a good explanation for this, but how is he supposed to know if he's not with the other pirates? They get to some pirate ships near West Side Island, and we see Marine challenging Plunder, who's making a long badass boast that he's conquered the seas in skies and Mobius. No, he hasn't. He's not running anything. Marine better be made competent and useful. It's a different universe from the games. 
And Blaze wasn't from the Soul Dimension as you see online, so I can handle Maureen being here instead of from the Soul Dimension now. But she better actually live up to her ego. It seems like she did because she made it all the way here. Plunder says he's challenged the Tantaror and won and overcome a curse. It better be explained how! Because I'm forced to just assume he overcame the curse the same way he did in SC Online. With pills from a janitor. Not explaining why he's free of the bad luck curse ever would be glaringly lazy bad writing. At least he references it, though. Sonic jumps onto the ship kicking someone and sarcastically says it's a privilege to be here. And Marine says this is a pirate affair. So she is a pirate here. It's satisfying to see Sonic interrupt her and send her flying, saying, Can't hear you! Don't care! She deserves it for trying to say that the hero of the world has no business being here. So she's an evil marine. A pirate. Cool. It's self-aware of her fan reception as a scrappy. And she's competent enough to get here. When Sonic's not bothering her, I guess. Sonic asks Plunder what's going on with his pirate friends. There's not even an explanation that the curse was just temporary. A wizard did it would be better than nothing. Zorbell says Plunder is innocent, and we finally see her talk to Sonic. She wants his help, and it's tedious that on the next page, there's way too many text bubbles in yellow with white text. And the text is repetitive, taking way too long stating that, go figure, the pirates want treasure. The pirates won't stop until Babylon would be theirs. Now, at least it's using Babylon Garden in a new way, but it's still lazy to use it instead of a new idea. Conveniently, Tails has already heard a story about Babylon, the lost city full of gold and jewel mountains. I know he's smart, but still, where would he have heard this story? He's not super social. He's not an archaeologist. It could have easily been written that Zorba would say this instead. He's not characterized as a complete genius in SDC, but he can still be curious about stuff. Zorbell says there is power in Babylon to make anyone who takes it the greatest pirate on the planet. But to find and use Babylon, you need five keys. That sounds video gamey. Why not just one key? Why not just two keys? Is that just taken from one of the video games? Because finding the MacGuffins is a common excuse to have you visit multiple areas in video games. She says that when the quarrels began, she was forced to take up with plunder. So how do you overcome the curse? Hello? Zorbell says that with his help, she's been able to keep the ski out of the evil pirate's hands. And she's holding a gray bracelet. And Tails says that ring is nearly identical to the device that Robotnik recovered from his base on Flicky Island. And apart from being a different color, it's the same device. After Amy says the Emerald Chamber will take a while for Porker to repair, she loses the signal. And Kitabora's long-range sensors are offline because someone's remotely shutting them down all over the zone to blind him. That's a very competent hacker. By the way, Angel Island once landed on a mountain in SCC. So why didn't Porker have to repair the chambers when it landed on a hard, rocky mountain? He says there's only one person that could do the impossible like that. And it turns out Robotnik is back. I was wondering if there was someone else, because we weren't told there was Robotnik right away. But this makes more sense, even if it's less creative. So Amy gets threatened with the Gamma Robots. It does make sense because they were nowhere to be seen in the SA1 adaptation of Sonic the Comic. So it's making up for lost time and continuing SA1. After refusing to surrender, she's totally helpless anyways and gets hit in the side by a laser and collapses. I had to be told that Beta was knocked out and got critical damage, but who cares? She still gets kidnapped about as easily as in the game, when she's supposed to be more badass than that version of Amy. In fact, she gets kidnapped a lot more easily than the game, because at least in the game, she could escape from the robot for a while. It took until after Twinkle Park for her to be kidnapped. And in Archie Sonic, she at least got to smash one of the robots to pieces first, and she needed two robots grabbing her at once to be kidnapped. To be fair, she's trapped in a room that might not be big enough that she'd have the room to avoid lasers for long enough, and she's outnumbered. And she has to stay still and face the robot to try to shoot at them, which makes her vulnerable. Still, didn't she get knocked out last issue? She got hit with the laser too, and I asked if she had rings to survive that. So this is a common theme so far. I hope Amy's gonna be at the level of confidence I actually expect later on. Because right now, she's much more useless than she was in SEC, and it's immediately jarring. 
She's just there to get hurt. In SCC Online, she still had stories to herself. Like a story with Amy and Techno. Speaking of friends who are just there to get hurt, the story ends with Robotnik kidnapping Kinterborn. I asked in the issue where Kinterborn was turned against Sonic by Grimer if that would be how they justify Robotnik taking over the world again. Because he can take over any TV and computer he wants en masse. This isn't SCC Online. It's just an alternate universe, it doesn't matter anyways. So I won't be too upset at him doing that. It contrasted from SCC Online. And while it would undo Sonic's victory saving the world in issue 100 if it took over the world, I'll always have SCC Online, which I consider to be the actual canon continuation anyways. Nigel Kitching even wrote a few of the stories. Either way, I'm sure Kintobor will be rescued at some point. It'd be pretty weird if he was never rescued, because he's one of the original Freedom Fighters that was introduced for Sonic the Comic. That'd be like if Sally was never rescued from Robotnik. This issue, by Alkita, was surprisingly alright. I was fine with going through it. I think I only found one continuity error this time. Two, if Sonic's supposed to be so fast in STC that him not getting to the courthouse in time is stupid. I was really surprised at that turn of events. But if he can only run as fast as sound, the speed of sound is only 343 meters per second. So maybe it makes sense that he was just too far from Grimer to keep the pirates from kidnapping him from his trial. But I wish I was told that outright and told how far away the city was from his home base, like in text boxes. Because I'm used to expecting him to instantly show up where he runs to. And he didn't. But it would have ruined the story if he somehow did horribly in a fight against the pirates when he has super speed in the homie attack and the tornado attack. So I think the writer did basically the best he could do with having their victory be believable. Short of outright having Sonic be asleep at the time. Like from the flu. So the heroes find out what happened to Grimer because his trial was going to be televised. So they decide to talk to Captain Plunder to get more information because he's a pirate like the bad guys were. Sonic gets to meet Zorabelle, which makes Zorabelle's stories feel connected to the rest of Sonic the comic. And they find out the bad guys want to get to the Babylon Garden and get rich. It's at least fascinating that it's used in this way. Though if Storm wasn't involved at all, it'd be a lot more. Instead of, like, of course. Because he's one of the Babylon rogues. But it's creative that only he is there. I wonder what unique, original personality he's gonna get. And the story ends with Kinderborn and Amy being effortlessly kidnapped by Robotnik because he has laser shooting robots and just Amy to fight them all. So that was tense. I didn't need to see a scene at the start where Robotnik reasoned himself back from despair because Zachary told him something that was always obvious though. It'd actually be more believable if that scene didn't happen and it just casually went on to have him act like he does in the games because that's what we expect by default. And he acted dignified last issue. Not like the depressing jerk who can't wait for the world to be destroyed by chaos. He could get the egg carrier and just want to destroy the world instead. He's not going to succeed anyways. I didn't want it to be a trend in this comic, but apparently this is yet another time that it rushed to resolving a plot thread that SCC Online resolved perfectly. In SCC Online, it made sense that something as significant as Eggman wanting to destroy the world and getting depressed would take longer to be resolved than just one scene after the two arcs it was used in. It made perfect sense that Eggman needed to be plugged into a computer by the head to regain his sanity at a point where he was powerful enough to send Badniks anywhere on the planet at will and see any part of it that he wanted. Of course he'd get a god complex from that and end up getting his motivation back. Even by the 270s, he still wasn't back to normal. And there was nothing wrong with that, because that was a significant idea, and Eggman acting like we expect has been done to death. So we need him to be different sometimes. Him being different for a while was a big, memorable thing that kept him from being stale and boring after all of that time of just being a serious, one-note bad guy. We could have some other villain be associated with the Egg Carrier. This is a different universe. 